goodbye and thank you for the tea. Uh, Bye. Ah! Terry Scott was a stalwart of British farce on stage and screen and became renowned as one of the great pantomime dames. But he reached the peak of his fame in the 1970s and 80s, playing the bumbling suburban husband in Terry and June. Do you accept credit cards? The real Terry was far more complex. He was a perfectionist who could be difficult to work with. His private life was rocked by scandal, and he twice fought life-threatening illnesses. But throughout his career, his energy and enthusiasm for performing never flagged. Born on the 4th of May, 1927, Terry started life as Owen John Scott. He was brought up on Tucker Street in Watford and was the youngest of three children, but the death from bronchitis of his older brother Aubrey at the age of six was to have a big influence on his childhood. I think he was a more treasured son as their only son remaining. And I think Dad felt that he needed to make up for that somehow, you know, be two, two boys in the house. Another factor that made Terry outgoing as a child was a slight deafness which he inherited from his father and would eventually pass on to two of his own children. There was a little bit of deafness even when he was young. I think, you know, he, he worked hard to get a lot of attention. And he would get kids together and play jokes and make a party happen, make things happen. You know, that, that was what he did, you know, from, from an early age. The excitable little boy was a persona Terry would later develop into one of his most enduring comedy creations. Who put salt in the sugar bowl? He played the character on stage, in TV commercials, and for the song. My brother. That little boy that he played was quite near the surface of Terry. If you look back on him, Terry was half of him was a little boy, and the other half was a highly intellectual chap. We always liked it when we were growing up and he, he would do the little boy voice. Certainly I did anyway, I thought it was really quite sweet. <laughs> I've always understood that the song My Brother and the character of the schoolboy, there was some connection between um, when his brother died, you know, and, and it was almost like it was Aubrey sort of making the song, but that was just, that's just my, my take on it. <laughs> Terry's first steps in show business came while doing national service in the Navy at the end of World War II. He performed stand-up comedy in cabaret and variety shows, but when he was demobbed in 1947, he tried to follow a more orthodox career. When he came out of the Navy, I think the next thing was, no, 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 got to do the normal thing, go and train to be an accountant and, and do a normal job. And he, of course, he, he did that for a bit, but very quickly he, he, he needed to expand on his creativity and he moved on and out. A spell on the radio on shows like Workers' Playtime was followed by appearances on television. Then, in the late 1950s, Terry got his break in farce when he joined the Whitehall Theatre Company. Mr. Riggs! He came and audition, and he was easily the funniest person who uh, actually read at the audition. Your makeup was atrocious, your clothes indescribable, your voice abominable, and your performance diabolical! <laughs> Otherwise, all right. He had a very expressive face. It was a bit like a hot cross bun, without the marking. I was always amazed how agile he was, because even in his slim days, he was never very slim. Yeah. But he, he was so agile, he could fly about the stage, and you had to run to keep up with him. I mean, seriously, physically run and mentally run to keep up with him. And his, probably his biggest fault was if you weren't as quick as him, he could turn around and say, what the devil are you doing? You know, come along, pull yourself together, and could be quite sharp. It led to Terry gaining a reputation for being a bit difficult to work with. He was a perfectionist. He wanted everything to be right. And that, I think, is to do with impatience. Um, you know, I can get it right, why can't they? Is something annoying you? <laughs> and that was possibly a flaw. Um, he could be a bit abrasive. He could be dogmatic. And, and 
if you didn't go beyond that to get to know him really well, um, and he would leave that mark, and oh, well, that's what he's like. And, but because I had the good fortune to be able to work with him for a long time, I got to see that very warm, vulnerable side and got to like him a lot. In the summer of 1957, Terry was appearing in Scarborough when he met dancer Margaret Pollan. Mum was rehearsing, dancing on the stage, and Dad came in late and saw her, and his jaw was slowly dropping. So I think he fell then, fell in love with her. I think it was about three weeks of courting before Dad said, well, you're going to marry me, aren't you? And, OK, fine. Terry and Maggie set up home in Whitley in Surrey and had four daughters, Sarah, Nicola, Lindsay and Ali. Oh, oh! Thank you, madam. No quarrelling today. Not too yeah. much trouble for Mum. Yeah. Promise? Yeah. Are we allowed to wait up for the cook No. Bed, early bed. If he had more energy, so it would be depending on what the nature of the work was, then he'd take us out to go to the seaside or come up to London for a visit or go and see a show. And, and then he'd be, you know, he'd have the energy to be funny within the family. So it would be very, very much dependent on what was going on at the time work-wise. Dad was like anybody. Some days Dad was jokey and loud and other days Dad would be quiet because he'd be thinking about work. And he did work really hard. But he was, he was good fun and he loved children and in many ways was a big child himself. Terry's childlike qualities found their natural home in pantomime, where he became legendary as a dame. <laughs> what a good-looking lot! How am I looking? Who said fat? Terry as a pantomime dame has got to be it, loud, brash and, and silly. He was good at it. I think he knew he was good at it and he loved it. He loved the dancing, he loved having to sing, he liked being funny, he liked being tragic and getting all the kids to believe in him and crying a little bit. He loved the whole thing. Did you like the prince? Did you, do you think the prince was, you know, lovely and, and princely? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. His strip routine in pantomime was a classic. Every, everyone adored it. Um, he was brilliant. My mother used to make a lot of the pants and decorate the cardigans and that. So any time that he had an idea about, oh, when I pull this pant down, I want top of the pops on the back, or I want winking eyes on the back, or I want these different things, mum would, mum would be able to make them for him. And it sort of made it a very personal thing, because we'd seen mum in the sewing room at home sewing these together, and then they were on the stage. So it sort of made it even more of a family thing. And I happened to have a pair here. They had eyes that flashed and winked, but they don't wink anymore. Putting the strip on takes about six minutes and three minutes to take it off, less than that. Um, this one here in the black is behind the screen when I do the strip. That's Lindsay, she's my daughter. It's always nice to have your family around you. You would start to do the strip whipping off the clothes and chuck them over the top and I had to sort of keep an eye on things and catch them and then at the end he would just walk behind the screen and I would help him put the negligee on. So he'd literally just go behind, come straight out the other side with the top that looked like magic, but it really wasn't. <laughs> but it was it was good fun because the atmosphere was good then. You know, he was always mucking about it. It was just nice to have time with Dad. By the mid-1960s, Terry Scott had established himself as a fine comedy actor on stage and television. Can I help you? Oh, yes, I hope so, yes. It's antenatal day today, gentlemen. You're not antenatal, are you? Good heavens, though, we're all for it. <laughs> but it was in 1968, when he joined the Carry On team, that Terry became a household name, playing leading roles in some of their most memorable films. He was... Remarkably good as a bullying heavy, which of course you require in fast. And what, may I ask, is that thing doing in there? As kids, the carry on films were slightly squeamish for us because um, they, were, they were a bit um, raunchy. It keeps my dangler warm. Give it here! For the last time, stop calling it a dangler! It's a spawn! 
you know, seeing your dad doing the carry on up the jungle, you know, where he's being tarted. And... <laughs> and we just go, oh my God, Dad, no, please. You know. I'm a woman. Woman. We were introduced on the set, and he looked a little bit alarmed because um, I was the new girl on the block. They were all very famous in the Carry On team at that time, apart from myself. And I think he was just so relieved that I knew my lines. Do we have to go that way, Ark? Not to worry. I show you. You hold to me tight. <sighs> but we, we were fitted with harnesses, which had um, great big hooks in our crutches. And then we were hooked to the ropes and, you know, sent spinning off into the trees. <laughs> After we'd been wearing these things for a few hours, we were both really unable to walk and we got sort of sores and we had to go straight to first aid to be given copious amounts of savlon and talcum powder. And I remember Terry saying to me, I hope you didn't want any children. <laughs> At the same time as his film career was taking off, Terry was also working on a new sketch show for TV called Scott On. It was during the making of that series that Terry first worked with June Whitfield. <laughs> the first time I met Terry, I was slightly in awe because I knew he was very established and I certainly wasn't. Sex is a terribly important thing, isn't it, he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and apparently when I left, um, Terry said, she'll do. The most successful sketches were the ones that he did with June Whitfield, always with June. <laughs> I could have married anyone I pleased. Yes, but you didn't please anyone. <laughs> they worked so well together that when Terry had an idea for a sitcom about a couple whose kids have grown up and left home, June was the obvious choice to play his wife. She's probably some frustrated old spitzer that doesn't know the first thing about marriage. Who does? Well, we do. There's not much you don't know after 23 years of it. No, dear, except that it happens to be 24. <laughs> Is it? I think that one of the successes was the fact that June Whitfield knew Terry and knew his quirks and were able to override them. Terry, yes, he, he was fussy. I mean, if, you didn't, if Terry didn't like the way you did something, he'd say so. And so you'd say, uh, oh, yes, that's, 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 yes, you're absolutely right. Got it. And next time, do it exactly the same way, and he'd say, that's better. June definitely really made it her job to um, cope with the difficulties of working with Dad. She did very well. <laughs> Happy Ever After ran for five years. But a writer's dispute meant that in 1979, the programme had to have a change of name. June! The first June! series of Terry and June went on air in October of that year, but it could very easily have been the last. Dad uh, had had a hemorrhage, and in them taking him in because of that, they discovered that he had an an aneurysm. Um, which, you know, an aneurysm, if, if it bursts, basically, you've had it. So they, they have to operate. And I went to see him in hospital after the operation, and he said, uh, yeah, well, they opened up my brain and, and let some of the air out. <laughs> <laughs> when Terry returned to work the following year, his performance had lost none of its energy. Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. The show was regularly getting audiences of 15 million viewers, and Terry and June became one of the nation's most recognisable couples. You looked at them, and it looked as though they had been married for years. And indeed, you know, everybody um, thought that, that Terry and June were husband and wife. Once we did um, a photographic competition, and at the end, we were presented with a camera. Terry said, oh, well, you can have this, and they said, oh, it's for both of you. And we said, well, thank you very much, but we don't actually live together, you know. Oh, thought, they were, thought we were married, or at least living together. No. The marriage to June was an act, but many of Terry's on-screen quirks were based on real life. You, you name it, I'll catch it. <laughs> well, you've never done it before. Yeah, well, the fish aren't to know that, are they? <laughs> Dad had that same thing as he did 
uh, in the TV program. He had that same sort of uh, got this idea, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it 100 and 10%. Well, I know you and your sudden ideas. It's always a case of, come on, June, let's do that tomorrow. And then the next day, it's, oh, June, why did you make me do that? He had to do something full tilt all the time. He went through phases of his life when he'd go running and things like that, and then he'd not go running, but he would try. He would try and stay physically fit. He would go through quite a routine of going for a jog, but he would put plastics on. He'd put bells on his ankles because uh, one of the dogs that we had had gone blind, so she would go running with him and so, so she could follow him. And um, then he'd come back and then he'd do press-ups. One. <laughs> and then the next thing he'd do is he'd have a, a rump steak, an enormous salad, I mean, but beautiful salad, and a glass of champagne. <laughs> and that was done, detoxing, and I thought... <laughs> Terry was larger in life in everything that he did. I remember he had the swimming pool, which steam used to come off it. You know, he could not bear to go into a cold swim. And you'd see steam rising from those. And in the morning, he was wonderful. You'd look out, you'd hear him warbling, and there was Terry in, I was about to say a yashmak, but no, it was a, it was a kaftan, strolling up and down his, his domain, just loving every inch of it. In 1987, despite its ongoing popularity, Terry and June was axed. There just wasn't any room for it anymore. Everything became in your face. And so now we have um, a lot of bonking shows and a lot of violent shows and a lot of audience participation shows. Um, but we don't have a lot of gentle comedy. The end of Terry and June coincided with revelations about Terry's own marriage being printed in the newspapers. He had no uh, censor. He would just say anything. He disclosed to somebody, you know, late nights over a drink, and then said, "Oh, you're not going to print it, are you? And next thing you knew, of course he did. And it made the front pages. And it really, I think, soured a number of people's attitudes towards Terry, which is, uh, is very sad. You know, Mum and Dad had a marriage that, you know, they had an understanding. And, um, but part of the deal wasn't that it would be out in the press. And so that was pretty earth shattering for all of the family. And I think dad was filled with remorse that it had got out. And then it, literally around the same time was diagnosed with cancer. Um, so, and then and he just, you know, he just plummeted really. He just went a bit uh, depressive, a bit, a bit manic. He just kind of was not, not a happy man. Not at all. Yeah. Terry fought the illness for seven years. However, he kept on working both in theater and as the voice of Penfold in the cartoon Danger Mouse. I mean, he wasn't somebody to sit about feeling sorry for himself. He kept active. He wouldn't let on to us that he thought he was dying. We wouldn't let on to him that we thought he was dying. There was kind of this unspoken silence going on. And, um, but there was a calm. And in that, things dropped away. It's quite beautiful, really. And I remember him saying, oh, that those difficulties in life, I just think of them as an inconvenience. And that was his sort of way of thinking about it. He, he, he things dropped away, yeah. I do remember Terry would sing louder than anybody else, which was slightly embarrassing at times. And I know at his funeral, I, I think that's what suddenly upset me more than anything, because I remembered how, uh, you know, Terry would be absolutely belting out the hymns um, in the church, and he wouldn't be doing it anymore. He gave a huge amount of pleasure over the years. He was a driven man, and he had his demons, but I think he was a good man, and he was a, a very loyal friend. He was, to me, when I think about it, he was Mr. Toad, Toad of Toad Hall. He was infuriating, <laughs> but, but 